Where I'm From, the podcast that proves no matter how far you go, you'll always keep a little piece of home with you. I'm Bill Meeks. Now this week, my guest I'm really excited about is singer-songwriter Stephen Page. And he's joining us to talk about where he's from, Scarborough, Toronto, Ontario. Now let's take off to the Great White North. It's a beauty way to go. Now you might know Stephen Page as the former frontman of Bare Naked Ladies. You know the guy who goes, It's been one week since you looked at me. Cocked your head to the side and said I'm angry. Five days since you laughed at me. Saying, get that together, come back and see me. Three days since the living room. I realized it's not my fault, but couldn't tell you. Yesterday, you've forgiven me. So no, sit back and wait till you say you're sorry. Hold since leaving the band in 2009, Steve's produced solo albums like Page One and Heal Thyself Parts One and Two from his current home in New York State. But Steve's artistic life got its first spark north of the border in Canada, specifically Scarborough, Ontario. Now, Scarborough is a district of Toronto, Ontario, known for the Scarborough Bluffs, the Toronto Zoo, and even a surreal sculpture garden. But everybody's experience with their hometown is different, so uh, let's find out about Steve Scarborough. Welcome to the show, Steve. I did warn you before we hit record that I'm a huge, huge Bare Naked Ladies and Stephen Page, obviously, fan. And so I'm probably going to be a little bit nervy dervy the whole time today. Uh, it's, you know, that's so much better than getting um, just getting kind of like sneered at through the whole interview. Quite nice. Thank you. Now, uh, was uh, growing up in Scarborough, was it a supportive environment for a young artist like yourself? In a way, yes. I mean, Scarborough just to give you a bit of a sense of what it, what it was and maybe what it is now. I mean, Scarborough mm -hmm. is uh, the, the city of Toronto. It's going to a small little geographic piece. And there were all these outlying boroughs, just m much like um, Manhattan and the five boroughs around it. There was um, the city of Toronto. And then there was Scarborough, East York, North York, the city of York and Etobicoke. And mm -hmm. they were called um, Metro Toronto, Metropolitan Toronto. And then in the mid nineties, they all got amalgamated into the city. So now they call it, they call it, at the time, they called it the mega city. So Scarborough is now just an, an area of Toronto. But at the time, it was its own city. Actually, when I was really small, it was just, it was just a town, I think. <laughs> um, but back then in the 70s, it was, I mean, you remember Wayne's World? Absolutely. With, with Mike Myers and the kids playing um, uh, road hockey and that kind of like Bob and Doug McKenzie guys with long hair and hockey sweaters that was kind of what scarborough was it was very white it was very kind of working class um people joked about it in in toronto it was kind of cultureless is how they saw it mm -hmm. um and for us bare naked ladies a lot of our our thing was like well this is where we came from and we're going to make fun of it but from the inside but also show that there's more to it than you think um so that and it's changed significantly now scarborough is incredibly multicultural and better off because of it you know there's just you know you see these thriving communities um you know when I, of all from all over the world bringing their food their religion their music their culture their educational ideas um and it's uh it's a real um active and exciting place where it seemed sleepy when I was a kid, you know, for me to get mm -hmm. downtown to downtown Toronto, there was a bus stop outside of my backyard <laughs> and I would get on the bus and take the Bellamy nine bus would take me to warden station, which was probably about 45 minutes on the bus. And then you had to take the subway, two subways to get all the way downtown. So it could take you a few hours to get downtown, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of, you know, it felt like you were abandoned out in the wilderness. But as yeah, far so as like, close to where all the action is, but just far enough away for it to be a pain in the ass. That's right. Like it just you're in another another city. And of course, you wouldn't want to admit to anybody you are from Scarborough. <laughs> but as a, you know, you're asking about you know, as a young artist, the Scarborough Board of Education, when it was its own board of education back then, had a fantastic music program and arts in general, um, not just in the schools themselves. And, you know, the, I took band and choir and stuff in school and it was fine but there were these citywide programs so as long as you mm -hmm. were part of your school's program you could then audition to be part of an all-city band or orchestra or uh, in my case choir so i when i was in grade nine i auditioned for the scarborough schools youth choir and uh, 
got in and every Wednesday after, after school, we'd get on the, on the bus and, you know, t- on the, the TTC, the, the Toronto Transit Commission, we get on the bus and get up to um, a- Agent Court Collegiate, a different high school, different neighborhood of Scarborough. Mm-hmm. And there'd be a hundred, 110 kids from all over the city there to sing with this great choir director, Garth Allen, who just, you know, I was never a sports person at all and still not. So, but to me, the closest thing I can imagine is this is the closest thing you can imagine to being in a, on a sports team, the sense of like, or like an elite sports team where we were all, nobody, the difference is nobody would go back to their own high school the next day and talk about choir practice. You know, it was kind of <laughs> with nothing anybody really bragged about, but we'd go there. It was like the, the nerd shame. <laughs> That's right. The nerd fight club. Um <laughs> And, uh, you know, so we didn't, we didn't talk about it outside of it. You know, sometimes I I would make the mistake. I'd see someone from choir who was like a cool kid at school. And I'd say, Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, we next week at choir, can we, can I get it? And he'd be like, (laughs) um, but you know, we would go there and like, he would yell at us and, you know, just, but, but basically work us up into, to develop this desire to create something excellent um mm-hmm. that you know something that was bigger than any of us individually and because of that like you kind of i never worked that hard i never had did anything where that was like it was that much hard work but also that rewarding and uh you know eventually we did like a concert tour of the uk when i was 15 and like you know that's a huge mm-hmm. formative thing for me Oh yeah, uh, but they also the other thing that that the Scarborough Music Program did was they would have a summer camp at the end of the school year every year for they would have a seven day camp and a ten day camp. It was north of the city, about two hours at a, at like what was a summer camp, but this was before their season started. And we would go there, and you'd be in, you know, again you would audition, be in a different band or orchestra or choir depending on your skill set and skill level. And then there would be in the evenings, there would be faculty concerts. So you'd hear these professional musicians who were teaching here the game yet to do their thing. Then there would be, you know, social stuff, whatever school dances or, you know, dances or concerts or whatever else. So it was this yeah. great kind of social slash musical situation where you're completely immersed in it for a couple of weeks. And I went there as a student. And then uh, when I was in university, I went back and worked there as staff. So I was there for like the whole month of June. And, uh, you know, that was where Ed Robertson and I first started playing together. I so was just about to ask I, you about that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Without <laughs> that, that those opportunities, there's no way I would have ended up doing what I, what I do. So I, it, you know, since we're talking about the music camp and stuff, like you said, you know, bare naked ladies would have never existed if it hadn't been for that camp. So for the uninitiated, I mean, obviously I know the whole backstory three different ways, but uh, why don't you tell people a little bit about bit about how you and ed sort of connected at that camp sure well i'll tell you i had a band in high school like ed ed was a guy who was always playing in cover bands and stuff and i knew him kind of from when i was in grade Mm -hmm. five and he was in grade four um and he always kind of scared me he seemed like a tough kid you know he was like wearing like whatever rush t-shirt and always kind of looked kind (laughs) of scruffy and kind of like i don't know he just had an, an air of being kind of you know the opposite of my very soft, quiet and scared child. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. he had kind of confidence and cockiness and, yeah, uh, yeah. and, a, and a roughness to him. So I just, I stayed away. Um, but I remember in, in high school watching him play in a cover band and like, I was one of the judges at a battle of bands and he, they did like, yeah, they did rush and they did some of that kind of like what, you know, rock and prog kind of stuff. And then they also did like Peter Gabriel and Talking Heads. And it's like, oh, that's music I like. Um, I thought, well, this guy is kind of well-rounded. <laughs> well, um, fast forward a few months and we were at music camp mm-hmm. and I was sitting around with some people and I was sitting by the fire or something. And Ed walks up and he is playing one of the songs that I had recorded with my friend Jeff Pounce. I had this group called Scary Movie Breakfast. It was myself and my friend Jeff. And, you know, the way we would do this was, you know, some kids in high school, when their parents go away for the weekend, they have a big party and they you know, get drunk and they have a hundred people over to the house. Mm-hmm. And 
that kind of thing. What we would do instead when our parents would go away is we would rent a four track cassette recorder from the music store and get a bucket of KFC and <laughs> make up songs and laugh and record them. Is KFC good fuel for, for lyrics or does it kind of like slow them down a little bit? There is a built in comedy with KFC. There's something I think I think the thing of, of two people with a bucket of chicken as a teenager for me seemed just hilarious. Um, <laughs> that's not for two people. You know, now as an adult, I'm like, that's just for one person. But at the time, <laughs> but that's for like a whole bunch of people. Um, and just the idea of like, I'm going to get some more chicken would be like, that would be humor for you. For us, that was like the funniest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Um and we, yeah, we would record these songs and laugh and then, you know, make duplicate tapes and send them, you know, give them to friends who would then tape them for other friends. It was the, the era of the dual tape recorder. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Ed, when at this music camp came up and he was singing one of the songs from that tape. And I was like, holy crap, he knows this stuff. What was the song I, out of curiosity? I don't, mm, I don't remember which song it was. Probably. Uh, really don't know was probably what it was. That's because gotcha. that's one that that's one of the scary movie breakfast songs that Ed and I sang together. There was that Lilac Girl was another one, which was a slightly later one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the yeah, so it was probably really don't know. But the thing was, we started singing it together in harmony, which was a thing Jeff and I had struggled with a bit. And uh, for Ed, Ed and I, it was effortless, and our voices just kind of blended together perfectly. And, you know, again, in, the, in not trying to be, neither of us wanted to be too effusive about how excited we were by that. We would just pretend it was, yeah, it's just, you know, we're fine. Um, <laughs> and that was kind of the end of that for a little while. Although, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've, I certainly would have loved to have continued making more music with him. But, you know, he had other other projects on the go. He was getting ready to go away to university or something at that point. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I, I saw him at a party that summer after camp and we were talking and laughing whenever. And I remember him saying, uh, whatever, I was talking about how I had tickets to see Bob Dylan. I said, do you like Bob Dylan? And he said, no. Nope. And I said, <laughs> oh, would, like, would you want to go see him? And he goes, no. And I said, well, I've got tickets. I had a pair of tickets. I didn't have somebody to go with, but I just bought tickets in case, you know, and hope, hoped I'd find someone to go with me. Mm-hmm. And I said, I have tickets. I mean, I'll just, I'll, you don't have to pay me or anything. He goes, well, yeah, okay, I guess. And so we went <laughs> and we went, it was at the, the Canadian national exhibition, the X, the CNE in Toronto. And, uh, you know, so it was like the equivalent of a state fair at that point. We walked around and ate, you know, made each other eat the most disgusting foods possible and laughed and went on rides and stuff. And then went on the, went to the, to the concert mm-hmm. afterwards. And, uh, you know, the concert was kind of, we were way in the back of this giant stadium and it was my first Bob Dylan concert. I didn't realize that you wouldn't necessarily know what songs he was playing until it was just about finished. Not even when you hear the lyrics coming from his mouth. <laughs> the lyrics are inaudible. And so we just kind of like just started talking and pretending we were like rock and roll critics from, you know, jaded rock and roll critics from the 60s or something, you know, boomers. Mm. And we were <laughs> in front of baby boomer rock critics who believe that everything that they see or deem to be worthwhile is exactly that um so uh you know we're talking about fake bands but you know as if they were real like you know a lot of people don't remember the first band on stage at woodstock because the cameras weren't rolling yet was this band bare naked ladies it was two guys with hip waiters and singing songs about soup and whatever and so we were laughing about all these different things we had a bunch of different band names and then fast forward a couple weeks and ed calls and says you know, I was telling you about that battle of the bands I was supposed to do with my cover band. Uh, they called and and confirmed and they said, uh, you know, we're really counting on you guys. And I didn't have the heart to tell them that we, that my cover band broke up. So I just told them we'd do it, but that the name had changed. Um, <laughs> so I told them we're called bare naked ladies. Um, so do you want to get bare naked ladies with me? And I was like, you told them what? <laughs> the, the joke name is like, okay, that's now the name. And we went and did this show and it was down at the Toronto city hall. So down in the big city, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it was the city hall in front of, uh, the, the, the plaza in front of the city hall. And we if went, I remember correctly, it's called Nathan Phillips square. 
You're right, because you can you'll see that show up in the history of the band. <laughs> Only a few years later, quite a pivotal moment of the band. It played, <laughs> played some major part major parts in the in the uh, band's history. Um, Absolutely. We went down there, and the whole plan was we were going to like rehearse earlier in the week and stuff, maybe a few times, and then we never did. It was like, oh, I'm busy. I got to do this, or don't feel <laughs> like it. So we never rehearsed. We showed up at the place and went, okay, let's go into the stairwell in the parking garage, and, and we'll figure out what songs we know. And we're like, do you know uh, uh, I Walked the Line, Johnny Cash? Yeah, I know that. Okay, let's do that. Do you know <laughs> uh, uh, Wishing Well by Terrence Trent Darby? Yeah, I know that. Okay, let's try that. And we just did that and a few of the the old scary movie breakfast songs and that kind of stuff psycho killer whatever and so we said to the people there okay here's the deal we you know it's just two of us and we, we think it might be better that we don't compete in the battle of the bands because uh you know it's a different thing but what, maybe what we could do is we could go out and entertain in between the bands while they're setting up and tearing down we can kind of like you know entertain with a, a short set in between they're like yeah sure sounds good Less so pressure for you, too, because, you know, exactly. everyone can go out there for five minutes, 10 minutes. Oh, my God, what am I going to do for the last five? That's right. So we did a few kind of five minute sets of these things while the other bands were setting up and tearing down and it also took all the pressure off us because we're like, we're not competing. We're just here goofing around. Mm -hmm. And then we won the Battle of Bands after anyways. And the prize was like, I think it was like 200 bucks or something like that, which was pretty good. In 1988. For oh, absolutely. That could be that could be yeah. rent for some people. In That's 19. right. <laughs> but we also got to open for a band called the the the, the um, Razorbacks, who were a rockabilly band. Mm -hmm. And they were awesome. Like they were we just we loved them anyways. We'd go see them whenever we could. But we we opened for them uh, at the Horseshoe Tavern in Toronto. And like that was a huge deal for us. I mean, it didn't get us anywhere. But the one thing that came from that was we thought, well, we can't change the name of the band now because if, <laughs> if somebody was at Nathan Phillips Square or the Razorback show and they saw us, um, well, then, you know, what if they liked us and if we change our names? They'll never find us. Yeah. And if, if they're like, do you guys know that band that has the two nerdy guys? I mean, in Toronto, they're probably going to be running there's probably going to be seven or eight options easy. That wasn't actually the case at the time. We may have created that, but uh, <laughs> I'm, at the time we were, we were fairly unique that way. I think, I think that was one of the things about the band that we really exploited as we went forward was that honestly, at that point in Toronto music, I mean, there were great bands, but most bands, it, remember this was the era in music when, um, the U2 Joshua Tree album was out. You know, think about the mm -hmm. imaging on that, the black and white, stark, very serious. No one's looking at the camera or each other. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of things like leather vests, and, <laughs> uh, you know, and, but there was also, there was that mixed with a kind of an earnest Americana kind of thing. Um, so you had bands. I mean, the bands that I would see a lot were things like, Andrew Cash or the Cowboy Junkies or Blue Rodeo or the Tragically Hip, uh, all mm -hmm. great artists, but their image was not nerdy or goofy. Um, it was kind of like, it was as if it was like an extension of the band or something like mm -hmm. that. And uh, had that kind of, kind of elevated, like it, kind of above it a little bit. A little bit, the sense of yeah. worldliness or a sense of like, we have it figured out in a way. And mm -hmm. uh, our image became the, the fact that we borrowed our mom's cars to come here from Scarborough <laughs> and uh, we're going to go back to our mom's houses and go to sleep there tonight. And we realized mm -hmm. that a good portion of our audience was the same. And that mm -hmm. was, I think, refreshing and kind of exciting to them that we were kind of not only admitting it, but having fun with it. And that became a lot of what our image was in the early days was that we weren't, that we were barely even a band. That was always mm -hmm. the way we presented it. It was like, it's not a real band. Even then, when we, as we started adding members, like Ed knew Jim and Andy Cregan from Music Hand mm -hmm. as well. He had played in their cover band that they had and was in the percussion section of the orchestra with Andy. And that he said, oh, we should get Jim and Andy to play with us for a show. And we'll call it our band, quote unquote. <laughs> It'd be really funny, like to, for one set reveal our bands we had them come over to ed's 
parents' basement where we were rehearsing and they showed up and we like started one song and like right away Ed and I looked at each other like we can't go back. Like this is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. And then they sang and we could do these four part harmonies and stuff. That mm -hmm. it it was like there was no looking back at that point. But early on we were just we never imagined we'd have more than the two of us. Are there any sort of like urban legends or big local mysteries or anything in Scarborough that were famous when you were growing up? Oh, interesting. Let me think, because I'm sure there are. I mean, there's things about like what, you know, schools that were haunted or that kind of thing or parts of a park mm -hmm. that was that were uh, in the song Light Up My Room. And mm -hmm. I sing about um, uh, whatever the ravine, the the shopping cart in the ravine and stuff Boom on the creek it's like popping ice cream sorry that's right. <laughs> oh, you're right and that's it <laughs> there's a shopping cart in the ravine the foam on the creek is like popping ice cream a field full of tires that is always on fire to light my way home so we kind of, that's in my mind, that is actually behind the McDonald's at Markham and Progress that we used mm. to go through these ravines. Scarborough, it, a lot of Toronto is actually made up of a, a network of ravines that go through these mm. little little rivulets. And, and uh, so you go down to these hills and you explore as a kid and you find like a shopping cart or there they there were for the longest time. There was a there was a VW Beetle in uh, just in the creek there. And we always. <laughs> so, yeah, of course, there were always. Um, you know, myths about people who live down there and that kind of thing. We never saw them, of course, but yeah, you explore and you make up all kinds of stuff like that. Somehow that always just made me feel good. I can put a spare bulb in my hand and light up my arm. And also that's, you know, that's also about kind of the, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, it, what we would have in Toronto too, growing up in Scarborough, were these hydro fields, is what we called them, because hydro is what they call electricity there, because it's largely or traditionally came from hydroelectric dams and stuff. So mm -hmm. the you know the the power company would be called Ontario Hydro or Toronto Hydro or whatever else. So a hydro field is just a you know a field where the where the power lines go, and there would be all these neighborhoods right under them or right next to them, and that's like where Ed grew up. Um, so that's that song to me, like I, I just I picture Scarborough, but I think a lot of people think of and I do, too. I think it's un, it's hard to detach the video for Lovers in Dangerous Time from the song. Like they're so intertwined. They are the same thing. And, and for a lot of people, that's that was what got them into Bare Naked Ladies. And that is essentially a tour of Scarborough. That video is us driving around Scarborough. Um, I mean, it's funny. This stuff you couldn't see because we didn't have the right lenses, whatever else. They're trying to like, <laughs> zoom in at the at one point on the nuclear power plant. And you can't really see what it is because it's just they, can't, they don't have a long enough lens for it. Uh, yeah. But we still do it. But it's like, you know, driving around through those hydro fields and strip malls and residential areas. And actually that the the area at the end where we're dancing in the field is right next to what was a and a's records in the scarborough branch of that where ed once worked too so that nice. to me that song even though it's not in the lyrics and we didn't write the song to me it's still the most scarborough of everything back to you know you and ed sort of forming bare naked ladies after you did that big uh, concert out on the square and everything you guys ended up joining a comedy band called quirky and the juice pigs and touring around canada what did that tour teach you about uh your native land of canada and what did it make you miss about scarborough yeah so we th this we were big fans of this group quirky and the juice pigs it was a trio and they were mu they were comedy but they were comedy and music and incredibly high energy and uh and just hilarious. Like the easiest comparison would be like, uh, you know, the, the three stooges meets the Ramones. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was so much more than that. And so, and absurd and just amazing. We would, every chance we got, Ed and I would go see them. And one of the things we would do everywhere we went, we had this, our first cassette that we made was called Buck Naked, which is the two of us. We would take this cassette 
to every show we and try and give it to the artist, which just means like crushing mm-hmm. against the stage and then trying to like <laughs> hand them the tape at the end of the night. And, Hopefully they don't toss it after after they get off stage. Well, I realize you know now yeah, they probably did, <laughs> but although we did send like we gave it to the the proclaimers who were we were huge fans of, and we did actually hear from their their manager at one point, like encouraging, which mm-hmm. was really nice. It was exciting. Yeah, uh, I remember trying to give it to Jonathan Richmond once, and he was like, "No, no, I don't, I don't take tapes." Um, that was that. But uh, <laughs> I remember giving it to Corky and the Juice Pigs. And then we'd see them again and say, like, have you listened to that tape yet? And they, they would be like, oh, uh, uh, yeah, actually, no, no, we haven't yet. But then eventually they did. And they they said, you know, we're doing this tour across Canada. Would you like to come with us? And of course we did. And that was like we basically we took a hiatus from university or dropped out because um, we never went back to do this tour. And we were 19. And it was, you know, I'd been away from home before, but not in that kind of setting where you're expected to work. And the thing was, you know, we were playing mostly like university comedy nights at their pubs and that kind of thing. And we weren't a comedy band. I mean, we were we were still saw ourselves as music with yeah. a sense of humor. Uh, and when you go up on stage at a comedy night, though, the audience is expecting a comedy group. So we had some audiences who did not like what we did, and probably for good reason. But that was mm-hmm. like, that's what it taught us was like, not every audience is the same. Do you want to earn their applause? Um, yeah. And if you do, then you have to learn how to kind of like tune into the audience and also how to pace your set list. All these kinds of things that we learned from Corky and the Juice Pigs. Um, and we also did get a sense of like what the different cities across Canada were like, what their similarities, mm-hmm. what their differences were, what their quirks were. You know, and that's where a song like Hello City about our first time in in, uh, in Halifax comes from. You know, playing at this place. I love Halifax, but at that time, you know, we were playing at this kind of place called the Lower Deck, which is kind of traditionally what they would have there would be like, you know, uh celtic folk music sea shanties you know that kind of thing <laughs> right on the water it's a sailor's bar like for real sailors and you know they had camp comedy night so fine people go there for comedy they did not go there for us i remember taking a picture on stage of the audience getting it developed later and not a single person in the picture was looking at the stage it was a packed house. <laughs> um you know so we learned a lot from that yeah, I suppose if nothing else, that that teaches you that, it, you know, once you play the worst gig of your life, any other gig that even if it goes halfway right, feels a lot better. right? Well, it's you know, that takes a long time because I think that then worst gigs like your definition of what a worst gig is uh, changes. It can be, mm-hmm. you know, I performed poorly and I'm angry at myself for that or I wasn't respected by the person who paid me like you know they they put us in a shitty place backstage or uh you know an uncomfortable place on stage or whatever so you're upset about that or the audience wasn't engaged so you're upset about that or you're upset with yourself for not being able to win them over now Mm -hmm. i feel like i mean i'm finally at a point where there almost isn't a bad gig like it's if you know if there's a bad gig it's fine i still the fact that i get to do this outweighs Mm -hmm. that it takes you a while it takes, it takes some years for, for most of us to get to that kind of zen point. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to be back with more from Steve Page. But first, a word from our sponsor. Where I'm From is brought to you by Strean Studio. That's S-T-R-E-A-N-N Studio. The web app that puts you in charge of the live show. Strian Studio allows you to take your streaming game to the next level by allowing you to stream to multiple platforms at once. If you want to go to Twitch, if you want to go to YouTube, if you want to go to a website that isn't supported even, you can stream to all of those platforms at once, get feedback from your audience, and most importantly, it puts you in control of the show. Now, Strian Studio has several packages that work for just about any type of broadcaster or podcaster. From the free plan, where you can stream with a watermark, all the way up to the gold plan, where you can have up to eight guests. You can stream to as many social platforms as you want. You can get a web link to share your show with external audiences. And you can even get an iframe so you can embed your live stream show directly into your website. 
And most importantly, moving forward, I'm going to be using Strian Studio to produce this show so you can see it live in action every week and see how well it works for me. Now, I want to thank Strian Studio for supporting where I'm from, and I encourage you to go there to check it out. The website address is strian.studio. That's S-T-R-E-A-N-N dot studio. It's a great app. I think you're going to love it. One thing I've always really liked about uh, Bare Naked Ladies origin story is that you guys were kind of like a viral hit before there was an internet. Sure. Like, a, you know, these kids who take off uh, doing music on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. Uh, you guys had a very similar thing, but it was kind of a low tech. Why don't you tell people a little bit about uh, much music and how that all kind of built up for you? Sure. You know, that's the thing. Like at the time we would do anything we could in order to try to attract an audience like we and it's I, like I don't know how we would have existed in this in this current time. Like the nice thing is I'm sure we would have been all over the TikToks, et cetera, and, and social media and really mm -hmm. done some fun and creative stuff. However, at that time, there was almost nobody, especially outside of the punk rock world. There was almost nobody doing it themselves, whether it was their their publicity, their distribution, their it was like you were waiting for a record company and a manager to come along and say you're worthy of my work. And then they would yeah, you know, feed you into the machine. And we were like, we didn't we didn't want to wait for any machine. <laughs> so for instance, we'd play we'd be playing a gig. And sometimes we like we played so much. Sometimes we would have three different gigs in one day. We would mm -hmm. play, you know, gigs every night of the week if we could. Just, you know, whether it was lunchtime at a community college pub and then dinner, that would be like, then it would be opening for some bigger band at the Horseshoe. And then it would be like an 11 o'clock set at some other bar. So we would do stuff like, okay, we're going to play at the Rivoli on Queen Street today, but I don't know if people know about that gig. So you know what we should do? We should set up in front of the place and we'll just busk there for the afternoon. Yeah, and that's what we would do. Like we would just busk on the street to let people know that we were playing that night. It, you know, that actually helped us later on. We went to South by Southwest. There used to be a Canadian showcase at South by Southwest. This would be in 91. And uh, I remember applying to be in the, the showcase and they rejected us and said no. And we were mm. like, okay, well, we'll see you there. And we just got <laughs> in a rented minivan and drove down there anyways and then just busked on the street in front of the canadian uh showcase and then when one of the bands couldn't get across the border they ran out and they're like can you take over for this band who couldn't get across the border and we ended up on the showcase anyways and that opportunity was we exactly we just we, we created the op the 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 uh availability which allowed for opportunities like that to happen um mm -hmm. we would just be everywhere so City TV, which was a local television station, but a kind of a very innovative uh, local television station and, and much music, which was the Canadian music TV channel, was an offshoot of City TV. They had uh, a very kind of an open plan, uh, an open concept studio for for their broadcasts. And it was very, you could see all the people behind the scenes. It was um just mm -hmm. a very different way of doing stuff back then. And they had on the corner of their building, a little video booth, kind of like your, 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 um, photo booth for when you get this, the, those, you know, four photo shots on a little, um, you know, a little strip of paper, that kind yeah. of thing. So when you put it, you'd put a loony in a Canadian $1 coin and mm -hmm. you had like 60 seconds to say your piece. And the point they call it speaker's corner. And it was to, you know, you could, it'd be like the editorial page, letters to the editor. And you'd be like, people would be like, what's with garbage pickup on Wednesdays or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, but you, you know, you'd get whatever other stuff, you know, people would go and moon the camera or and pay for the privilege. That's right. <laughs> um, and then they would compile this stuff. Some of it they would put on the news that night or whatever else, but once a week they would have a show called speaker's corner and it would be mm -hmm. a compilation of kind of the best of the stuff they got. And we went in, we, uh, and we said, well, why don't we just go in there? We'll, 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 we'll record 
a cut down version of Be My Oh Hono. The five of us will cram into this booth and uh, and we'll do that. And we, so we went in and we said, hey, we're bare naked ladies and we're too cheap to make a music video. So here's our video. <laughs> We're bare naked ladies, and we're a little too cheap to make our own video, so here you go. One, two, three, go. Oh. If there's someone you can't live without, so, oh, oh, oh. And if there's someone you can just show out. And we did this and sang it mostly a cappella. Ed plays guitar and uh, didn't think any more of it. And we get a call from the people at Much Music and at Speaker's Corner. They're like, this is what we've been hoping someone would do. No one's done it before. This is amazing. We're going to show it on, the, on, the, on our show. But they got such a good response from it. They decided to actually put that video into rotation on Much Music next to, you know, Michael Jackson and Madonna and whatever else. And there's this stupid thing. And then a lot cheaper have, than the videos Madonna and Michael Jackson were putting out at the time. Exactly. I mean, you know, by hundreds of thousands of times. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that got us into their studios and got us on their radar. And, and they realized that we were a kind of band who were happy to just be anywhere they wanted. There was another example mm -hmm. was uh, the song Be My Oko Ono. We had uh, submitted, there's a, a radio station called CFNY and part of their mandate um according to the crtc which is their the canadian version of like the fcc part mm -hmm. of their mandate was that they were supposed to invest a certain amount of money and airtime in nurturing new canadian talent so they had a talent contest every year where they would make a cd with the you know the, the best song submitted and they would have a, a live showcase same thing where they they came to us and they said well your out your song didn't make the actual cut, but we love it, and we want to put it on as a bonus track. Um, so we just need your master recording, and I didn't have the the guts to tell them that they had the master recording that we did it on a cassette <laughs> in my basement, in my parents' basement. We're like, you know, a four track cassette recorder, dubbed it onto onto cassette and sent them that. Well, I should have just said, well, that's it. But I didn't. I, so I went, okay, guys, what we got to do, we got to get some studio time. So then we like got into a studio for the first time ever, recorded the song, totally different version of the song. And it's now done, you know, with all this reverb and whatever else and multi-tracking in a studio. Yeah. And then we, I sent them the, the DAT, the digital tape of that. And they never said anything. They put it on this, on this album as a bonus track. And it ended up becoming one of the biggest hits on that record. Like they put it in rotation. It was top 20, whatever on the station and so on. And then on the release date, uh, when they were supposed to have this big showcase concert at a big club in Toronto, we just showed up and played out in front again. And again, that's, that was the thing people remembered was us busking out front and ended up, you know, having this, having this big hit that really got kind of got us to the next level. One thing that's always struck me about your music is that you have this sort of a thread of like a dark humor to it, which, you know, isn't too surprising because there's a lot of comedy legends that have come from Scarborough, Toronto, like uh, Mike Myers, the kids in the hall, etc. What do you think it was about the area in the late 80s, early 90s that made it such a fertile breeding ground for alternative comedians, musicians and musical comedians and every mix of of that? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, uh, Jim Carrey is from Scarborough as well, or spent spent time growing up there. Um, mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, I think the ability to poke fun at ourselves is a tr is a Canadian trait. I think Scarborough, because mm -hmm. of its slightly removed geography from the rest of the city, meant people stayed in and watched a lot of television. <laughs> you know, that's how I think a lot of people owned their crafts. <laughs> um, and things like comedy and music and sport are ways to distinguish yourself from your peers at school and everywhere else. It's a, play. it's a way to separate yourself and to also to also entertain. But maybe it's a ticket out for a lot of people as well. 
Yeah, it, it definitely was, uh, you know, for, for you guys and, and a couple of the other people I mentioned, uh, just so much great art came out of there in the late 80s, early 90s. Was there a sense then that, you know, you were bumping elbows with legends or f- soon to be legends? Uh, or was it just like, we're all just a bunch of kids here practicing our art, having fun? We didn't know anybody else from Scarborough. We knew them when we would go downtown to Toronto and then you'd be like, oh, you like, you know, whatever. So I know Mike Myers, older brother, Paul, who I'm good friends with. And he we opened for his band mm-hmm. a bunch and so on. We were like, oh, you grew up in that area or whatever else. And like you kind of like it was almost like, like I was saying before, a bit of a secret. Um, you know, and most of those guys, like kids in the hall, are a little bit older than us. So for us, like they were definitely part of the same scene as us, part of the downtown. Like they played rock clubs as opposed to comedy clubs. Um, but they were mm-hmm. already like when we when we started playing down there, they were already a big ticket in those clubs. So when we got to know them yeah. better in the 90s, they were kind of at the top of their game. And because we had become successful as well, you end up kind of rubbing shoulders in a different way. Yeah. I was going to say about the, the the weekend, for example. You know, he's from he's from Scarborough, and he's probably the biggest star ever to come from Scarborough. Um, but you know, you mm-hmm. want to, like, or you know, in our day too, it would be like Maestro Fresh West was a was a rapper who was really big in Canada, and he was from Scarborough, and he'd rap about Scarborough places, and he'd be like, "He's talking about Scarborough," <laughs> but you know, like, I'd have to stop if I ever <laughs> met the weekend. I would have to like stop myself from kind of like going, "Hey." Scarborough. I'd have to wait for him. He, being the bigger star, would have to be the one to initiate the point and say Scarborough. Yeah, and and then you could engage with him on that level. Exactly. You probably feel a responsibility, right, to kind of like promote that area and give back to that area in your art when you're promoting your art, all that stuff. Where do you think that stems from? I think part of it for us was, I mean, I don't think we, I don't feel that way necessarily now. I do feel grateful mm-hmm. for the time I had, but at the time I felt like there was a Canadian, I mean, I mean, I hadn't fully figured it out, but Canadians really like, like they like to identify other Canadians out in the world outside of Canada. You know, it's one of mm-hmm. these things, you know, and I'm Jewish too, and Jews do this all the time. Like, Oh, did you know this actor was Jewish? Did you know, this guy was Jewish. You know, um, <laughs> And so to be, you know, if there was someone who was Canadian and Jewish, like that's like Leonard Cohen, that's perfect. But that's uh, your best friend. That's right. <laughs> but you, uh, so I think as a kid, you're always thinking about that stuff. But adults do it too. But there's always the sense we would have people stop me, stop us on the street, and say, "Hey guys, you know, love what you do. Stay Canadian." And it was almost like a threat. It was like, <laughs> "You better stay Canadian. Don't." Don't go to L.A. And I mean, even though the people like this don't um, who say that stuff, they probably super they're big Neil Young fans. But for some mm-hmm. reason, me, <laughs> don't you dare go to Los Angeles. Uh, don't you <laughs> dare follow your dreams as long. Keep your dreams small. It's a very it's a very <laughs> weird thing. It's like don't get too if you get big outside of Canada, we might just mm-hmm. disown you. Um, and I think some of that comes from. Things like, I think, especially for our generation, when Gretzky got traded to uh, to Los Angeles in 88, it's the same year also when Ben Johnson got uh, accused of, of uh, cheating in the Olympics and lost his gold medal. And I think those two things were hugely emotional things for Canadians in general. And I think they messed with the Canadian psyche that Canadians were nervous, became nervous that, that they would become somehow laughing stocks or the thing that made them feel Canadian is all of a sudden mm-hmm. no longer Canadian. How do you reconcile that? And I think sometimes Canadians yeah. overthink it. So I think we always mm-hmm. felt like if we won an award or whatever else we had to go, Hey, Canada, Scarborough, <laughs> just to let everybody know that we hadn't changed. And um, so they didn't throw the full boxes of Kraft macaroni and cheese on stage when he came back. That's right. And they, uh, you know, they, so, I, but I think, I think now we realize that like, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. They'll turn on you anyways. There's nothing you mm-hmm. can do to, to make them not turn on you. They, they, when they want to, they will. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. but you know, we wanted people to, and, and the, the idea of the idea that we had of let's show people we haven't changed is kind of, mm-hmm. is kind of, bogus because like you're allowed to change 
Yeah. I mean, be aware of where you came from and be grateful for that. But you're, I mean, I, I encourage people to change. You don't have it all figured out when you're 20. Oh, absolutely not. If I, if I, if I had to live by the decisions of my 20 year old self, I, I'd be in a bad, bad place. Yeah, exactly. I think most of us would. Drove downtown in the rain, 9.30 on a Tuesday and I just checked out the late night record shop. So, you know, you guys start Bare Naked Ladies. You release that first big album, Gordon. One of the songs on that, I think, kind of ties back to your hometown a little bit. And that's Brian Wilson. Uh, it mentions, you mention in it, a late night record shop. Now, you know, I'm a huge BNL nerd. Uh, so I know that that references a record chain called Sam the Record Man. Why don't you tell people a little bit about that and uh, why it was such a special place for you? Well, by that point, I had moved, my parents had moved to a northern suburb called Richmond Hill, and I'd left all of my Scarborough friends behind, was very you know, depressed about that and felt very alone. Mm -hmm. And going to school would take like a 20-minute walk to the bus stop, which was not great in the winter, and then take the bus. It took me a long time to get to school. So once I could drive, I would drove everywhere. And one of the things I would do is get, you know, borrow my parents' car, my grandmother's car or something, and I'd drive downtown to downtown Toronto at the corner of Young and Gould Street. There were two big record stores. One was A&A's, which later became HMV, and uh, Sam the Record Man. And it wasn't until years and years later, because I I'm, it was always a huge record collector. I mean, for me, the place where I felt the most calm uh, and the most at home, anywhere I went in the world was always a record store. So wherever we toured across Canada or in the United States or in Japan or in the UK, like going to record stores was my place. Like that was the, that was my goal. That was the thing I wanted to do. It was even what I wanted to do when I'd go visit my grandmother in Florida or whatever, to go to the, you know, <laughs> I'd like to go to the record store. Um, so Sam the Record Man, which was three floors of records, was huge. Wow. I realized much later was one of the greatest record stores in the whole world. It was just a big part of kind of Toronto's music culture. And and for us later on, once we'd actually recorded some of this stuff, you know, we did the Yellow Tape, which is a five song demo that we had recorded and started having some uh, uh, retail demand to be able to buy this thing. It ended up going gold in Canada, selling over almost 100,000 copies of, the, of this five song cassette. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was largely thanks to Sam the Record Man. I also worked at a Sam the Record Man in a mall in Richmond Hill where I was living as a later teen, um, which was, a, you know, I, my dream come true, except it was in a mall store, which was mm -hmm. a total bummer because A, all the records were expensive and B, I wasn't allowed to play anything I wanted to play. It was basically just whatever the man, the owner of the franchise let us play, which was like, um, <laughs> you know, the california raisins a cocktail soundtrack wait so it was a little bit like um you know you're a big fan of mcdonald's then you get your first job at mcdonald's and you're like you know i still respect a quarter pounder but it's not my favorite anymore <laughs> but i think it's exactly <laughs> like that probably yes I don't, it's also the days of like you had to call in credit card authorizations like there was no mm -hmm. automatic thing to do that there was no like there were no modem lines or anything else so you would, you know, if, if there was a lull in sales and be like, okay, you got to call in credit card authorizations and like, mm -hmm. so you'd have these handwritten credit card slips yeah, and then have to call Visa and then they go, yeah, that one's declined, but you can't do anything about it. The person's already <laughs> left the store with the goods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a different time. I feel nostalgic about that. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll wrap up here. Uh, we're going to do a little game I like to call Hometown Hot Takes. Hometown Hot Takes, where I give you sort of a this or that, and you have to give me a choice and why you chose it. Uh, okay, these are Canadian landmarks, uh, or Toronto landmarks. The CN Tower versus Nathan Phillips Square. Oh, I'm going to say I'm gonna say CN Tower. Even though Nathan Phillips Square is important to us, CN mm -hmm. Tower is quite spectacular. Absolutely. One of the largest uh, freestanding structures in North America, isn't it? Right. It used to be the largest and we were we would always make sure people knew that. But I mean, <laughs> I remember it being constructed. It was exciting when I was a kid watching it, mm -hmm. you know, be finished off. And then, uh, you know, my my kids, when they were younger, they would be very excited to go up up to the top. So, you know, I have good lots of good memories of that place. 
Nice. Okay, uh, much music versus MTV. Oh, much music. Absolutely. I, you know, uh, my time on MTV as an artist was very limited. It was only a few songs that they showed on there. Although I do remember when I was living in Florida when I was 12, uh, I babysat for this kid who had MTV in his house. We didn't have it at our house. And I got to yeah. watch Der Commissar uh, over and over <laughs> again, which was pretty exciting. But MTV, or much music, I mean, rather, was such a, was so instrumental to both my, my taste and also my mm -hmm. career. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Poutine versus ketchup chips. Oh, poutine, hands down. First of all, poutine is awesome. And and back in the day, that was like one of those things on Ed's and my first tour. Like you couldn't get poutine outside of Quebec. It didn't exist outside of Quebec. Uh, so you'd have to go to a place in Montreal and you'd get it and be like, oh my God, I'm eating poutine. That's so amazing. We would have fries and gravy. Fries with, with gravy was a thing you could get at any corner store. In, you know, yeah. But not with the cheese curds. Now, of course, it's ubiquitous. But so it was special then. And also, I hate ketchup chips. Um, <laughs> ketchup I've chip never had chips. them. Ch there are, imagine you have a bottle of ketchup, like the old style glass bottle of ketchup in a diner. And you go through the diner and you just scrape off the dried bits from the top of the bottle into a bag of chips. Ooh, that's yeah. not great. No, that's not, not great. great. And uh, this is probably going to be a bit hard for you, um, but I thought it would be funny. Uh, Mike Myers versus Paul Myers. You know, you mentioned Paul earlier. Oh, yeah. You guys were friends. He wrote a book about you guys. That's right. Well, Mike, I mean, one of the things to think about with Mike is the fact that think of the number of catchphrases that man has invented that are, that are, that mm -hmm. are part of still, whether they are, you know, swing, do I make you horny, uh, uh, one billion dollars, like, but they're like, I, uh, we're not worthy. This thing. That people still do the <laughs> bowing motion. That's all him. Like, and uh, you could go through every one of his characters and probably pick out seven different catchphrases that have been completely mm -hmm. removed from the characters they're a part of. That's yeah. some genius. That is incredible. Um, so I think he needs he needs to have that respect. But Paul <laughs> is my friend, and Paul's been an important part of my life. So I would choose Paul. Please, good, let him good know. answer. Ecumenical answer. <laughs> Okay, uh, Tim Hortons versus A&W. I'm going to say... I, I'm going to say A&W, even though uh, I'm, I don't care about the root beer. It's too warm. Mm -hmm. uh, don't love it. I like the fact that Craig Northey, my partner in, in music, can, can get a veggie burger there. He can get a Beyond Mate burger that he enjoys. I don't love their mm -hmm. food, but I like the mm -hmm. fact that it's the quirky fact that it's so popular in Canada. Uh -huh. And Tim Hortons, again, its ubiquitousness is what makes me upset because often traveling in Canada, it's the one thing you can eat. And I, I don't want that. OK. And the last one here for you, uh, Canadians are polite versus Canadians are sick of people assuming they're polite. Oh, uh, I don't think Canadians are sick of that. I think people I think Canadians now are passive aggressive and want people to think they're polite. And I don't think they've earned that. <laughs> I think they are losing that politeness. They're coasting on their reputation. Exactly right. That that is right. Hometown hot takes. So you're in New York, right? Yeah, I'm in the Syracuse area. I moved here uh, about 12 years ago or so. This is where, where my wife Christine is from, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I never imagined I was going to live outside of Canada. You know, part being Canadian is such a big part of my identity, both publicly, both part kind of the, the shtick of bare naked ladies is all about a lot of it was about being Canadian uh, and particularly 90 yeah, percent of what I know about Canada is from being a bare naked lady. So right. <laughs> we do our best, you know, and I think we always felt like, you know, we were being kind of judged like people, Canadians were like, don't screw up. <laughs> and then I screwed up, so I had to leave. Um, it's not exactly what happened, but uh, I came down here just because this is where Christine is from, and this is where our kids are, and, and so on. And uh, at first, I felt like I just felt like if I was going to come to the United States, I, I always imagined I'd live in New York City or Los Angeles or something, you know, some entertainment hub where I'd be there for work. Um, but uh, I've really gotten to know and like the place. I mean, obviously there are social and political things I disagree with, but there, there are tons of those up in Canada too, I've realized. You know, there's a lot that I've learned from 
being a Canadian living outside of Canada about kind of can Canadians own weird um, uh, kind of mixture of uh, imposter syndrome or this inferiority complex that they, they, they have mixed with this grand superiority complex, which I find kind of annoying. Uh, so coming here where, you know, I think most people know, hey, we're imperfect. Uh, it feels like a more, it feels like um, <laughs> there's some possibility here sometimes too. Uh, it's it's great because this is what like I guess what they call the Rust Belt. You know, it's part of the part of America along the mm -hmm. Great Lakes that has seen better days as far as the uh, manufacturing and transportation hub that it once was. Um, so it's kind of you see all these cities along here trying to find new ways of uh you know existing of raising money mm -hmm. and you find a lot of kind of creative and interesting uh small businesses because of that and new kinds of communities that pop up because of the affordability of real estate or or those kinds of things uh and uh it's a uh, it's it's actually quite an interesting and exciting place to live well, I, I know that, uh, you know, with your work with Bare Naked Ladies, you guys were never afraid to get political about local Canadian politics. I think of like the songs like, uh, you know, you will be waiting and things like that. Uh, it, does living in the States now make you feel like you have a, a bigger uh, opportunity to comment on American politics, too, or at, at least the right to? Well, you know, in the song um, uh, White Noise, I say, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I had to learn to bite my tongue or they'll send me back to where I came from. Cause I, there is that sense of like, I'm, I'm here, I'm a guest, you know, I, I have a mm -hmm. green card, but I'm not a citizen. So there's a part of me that thinks, and that's, you know, being, a, uh, being Jewish and growing up in the shadow of the Holocaust, it always seemed like hyperbole, you know, I, this idea of like, well, if I make too much noise, they could send me home or worse. And I thought that, you know, maybe that was paranoid of me and perhaps it was at a certain point in time. And now it seems like, eh, you know, come 2024, who knows that could be, they could be, <laughs> they could be rounding us all up and sending us elsewhere or locking us down. Who knows? Um, so it is, it, I feel like I have to um, tiptoe a little bit and also just the world, the way the world is now with social media, everybody's opinions are so, are so strong. And mm -hmm. also, so uh, everybody is so convinced that they're right um, that uh, it can get pretty frightening pretty quickly. Maybe I don't want to engage. So I try and save that now for the songs more than I do the um, uh, pithy uh, quotes on Twitter or whatever. Yeah, you'll get feedback from the songs, but it won't be 10,000 rage tweets directed in your direction. It, it might be. I mean, I certainly I certainly see see the stuff show up on my YouTube. And But the thing is... Uh, um, the way people criticize you quite often is like, it's the way that they give Yelp reviews for restaurants. Like they expect <laughs> like customer service from the artist. Like an artist is going to come back and say, how do we earn your business? You know, how much, you know, how much more right wing should I be in order to earn your business as a fan? And like uh, what those people don't seem to realize is I don't care if they never listen to what I do again. It's okay. It's yeah. Fine. Yeah. Well, I will say that, you know, coming on my show show this week, you have definitely earned my continued business. You've had my business for the past, you know, 20 years or so. But that's good. See, that's what I'm that's what I'm here for. It, that's how, that's how you build a fan base. Just go on a bunch of podcasts. Everybody has a podcast. Eventually you'll hit them all. Yep. One by one. I, I get people can just uh, oh, sure. I'll do your podcast. Just join my Patreon. <laughs> All right, Steve. Well, I want to thank you again for for joining us today. It's it's been fantastic getting to talk to you. Um, I, as I mentioned up at the top of the show, you know, you're one of my heroes. I have your songs in my ears probably seventy percent of the time. I'm listening to music. I know you've been doing a lot of these uh, live from home live stream shows, uh, starting with the pandemic and continuing on. Uh, why don't you tell people how they can uh, check those out? Sure. If you come to stephenpage.com or check any of my social media stuff. Um, you can see where the next live from home will be. There's at least one a month I try to do. Some mm -hmm. months there'll be multiple. And they're on Saturdays uh, on Zoom at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. And I usually go for a good two plus hours. I play requests. I play hits. I play all the old stuff. I play covers. It's all over the place. And it's uh, saved my life over the course of the pandemic. That's for sure. And I'll say save my life too. Like that was like when things were the darkest, like that was always a highlight, like getting in there to jump in and chat with fellow Stephen Page fans, listen to the music. Uh, 
always so great. Uh, you have a new album coming out soon too, don't you? Yeah, we're looking at uh, the goal is to have it out September 29th. It's called Excelsior. Mm-hmm. I hope you enjoy it. It's uh, it's uh, 11 brand new songs. I guarantee you it's all I'm going to be listening to for the rest of the year. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Bill. Now, it is early days for where I'm from here, so we don't have all of the socials and the emails and everything set up yet, but you can go ahead and feel free to email me, bill at billmeeks.com, with your reaction to Steve's stories about Scarborough, some stories about your hometown, or future people you'd like to see come on the show. Well, that does it for this week. Join me next week where I talk to somebody else about where they're from. I've been Bill Meeks. See you next time. Bill Meeks.